Good evening, everyone. Let's start our first science cafe in January and in this year. Obviously, in January, it's the first one and because of it's only, but the first one in this uh, year. And uh, we will do uh, some uh, new, uh, discuss some news about astronomy and uh, uh, a discussion which collected for some uh, time, we collect some data in archaeoastronomy. So let's do it step by step. And after each talk, we will have enough time to uh, discuss topic. If you want, you may ask questions. So long period variable stars in 2024, there should be some. And uh, Matvey Dubishkin will uh, give talk about it. Uh, Matvey is a student of Astronomy Academy of uh, Keaton Planetarium and Observatory. You are welcome, Matvey. Yes, uh, one minute. I have some technical problems. And while I'll explain what is a uh, uh, Keaton Astronomy Academy is, uh, it is uh, one part of our organization which is uh, uh, which works with uh, students in schools. And we have for uh, junior school, for gymnasium level and for Likio level, uh, three years everywhere. So formally, let's say technically, one student may attend nine years of astronomy <laughs> instead of one year in school. <laughs> so, and uh, gym, uh, Likio uh, level, Likium level is... Uh, um, for uh, students of the last uh, three years study. And uh, Matvey and Dara, they participate in the last uh, Likio level. It consists of three years, uh, the basic, the advanced, and the uh, highest level. And uh, on the highest level, we have the most, uh, in, I, I could not say the most interesting tasks, but uh, tasks which apply more sophisticated methods in mathematics. Matvey, are you ready? Uh, almost. Okay. So let's say then a few words about what is long period variable stars. One of them I like a lot. It is Omega Seti. It gave name practically to the type of, or one type of long period variable stars. It's, uh, they name it Mira. And uh, Sometimes, most of time you don't see it, but once for a few months, once in a year, in average, let's say, you may observe it uh, like not very bright star. And uh, if you use telescope, and I was lucky uh, some time ago to observe its maximum, and uh, with telescope it looks really red, like on the uh, picture. Uh, let me show a picture again. Share screen, like on the on this picture. It's another variable star, but all stars of type of Mira, they are supergiants uh, of red color. So that's why it's uh, partly it's one more uh, way how to recognize that, yes, you are observing this star, type of star. And uh, it uh, could achieve uh, brightness around two and a half, a bit less than two and a half, I mean, uh, Mira itself. But uh, most of time it's around plus 10. So most of time it's visible only with telescopes. And uh, only for a short period of time we may see it in between head and the tail of the whale or SETI constellation. So something finally connects them. The interesting part about it these variable stars, uh, mirror itself, is that the way how they discovered it, actually, uh, we have the designation Omega Seti, so it means that someone in medieval times already saw it by naked eye and gave the uh, letter Omicron, uh, Omicron to the star. And uh, when time passed, that person should observe that hey it's absent again <laughs> but let exist so it should be a really interesting situation with its observations so to give name omicron it means that that period when the na uh, the names were given the star was visible though it's not visible constantly and in our kitten planetarium and observatory we have 
part of uh, observers, part of groups which are connected with variable stars. Uh, not obligatory, long period variable stars, but some students in schools did their uh, observations, educational observations. And uh, we have in a course for uh, methods of astronomy, uh, the sky is alive, the uh, section which is dedicated to variable stars only. And uh, there we discuss different types of them and how to observe them. And uh, some of them, like cataclysmic, any observation is very important. And uh, actually, for, uh, many stars, variable stars, are not, uh, cha don't change their brightness like clockwork. So not by clocks, but uh, some of, uh, change of brightness depends on just what's going on inside that star system right now. And uh, that's why each observation is important. And from this point of view, observations of a methods of astronomy has important uh, contribution to science. Once we had a talk of uh, Stella Kafka, she uh, in the International Astronomical Union, is uh, head of section of variable stars and she gave talk about uh, Betelgeuse, how or what happened with that star. It was interesting talk by itself. It was recorded at uh, our Science Cafe uh, database so anyone could watch it now. And uh, that uh, uh, talk shows cooperation between the methods of astronomy and scientists. So uh, I use the uh, American Association of Variable Stars to uh, look to find some uh, long period uh, variable stars. Unfortunately, most of them are now very dim, but uh, I found some which are uh, a bit interesting. So, so there's uh, our Carina, which is um, um, Here's the graph which show the magnitude of the star, and right now it's uh, on the it's rising. So within a few weeks, it should be at maximum magnitude. It is uh, near the, it is in the southern pole. So it um, it is, uh, I think it's not visible from the Cyprus, but if anyone is uh, living uh, southern, the he might see this. Um, so next is in the Hydra. It is closer to the celestial equator, so it should be visible to most of the people. Um, unfortunately, it get now it gets dimmer according to the graph. But um, as I said, most of them are very dim right now. So next time found is in the triangulum. Uh, it uh, in it is now it now brightness uh, brightness uh, is brightness it's uh, quite high. Mm. Also the most famous one is the Mira, but it's uh, now it's uh, the dimmest. Uh, uh, what's it's now the dimmest and you can see this okay and when to expect a maximum of Mira did you check well um, Mira has a period of uh, 330 days so now it's about the minimum so in uh, somewhere in the beginning of the summer it, it should be maximum Okay, and what's about the sun? Will it interfere as well or not? Uh, the sun... Uh, I think yes. Because of the way how I look at this graph, which you show, uh, we uh, had wait. maximum in May or about previous year, 
and the sun constantly interfere from uh, April to uh, to May. So one month is of or two months of observations are uh, absent because of the sun close to thirty. Yes. So and this time, I it's it seems that this year it will be maximum will be precisely when the sun will be next to it. Yes. Okay. And what's about next maximum for uh, our triangle? Our triangle. So it will be within uh, some uh, weeks, probably. It's so quick. Oh, it's on the right side now. The latest observations were in the January. The here, the on the I right. See. I see. So it should be um, about maximum in. Uh, quite soon. I see. So it's the best time. And the triangle is in Zenith practically now in overhead. So it's really possible to observe it. Which instruments do you recommend? Oh, a small telescope or a binocular. Thank you, Matvey. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next topic is about uh, meteoroid 2024BX1. It happened that it was discovered this year, the year just started, and uh, it has interesting adventure. And uh, uh, Ara Magdesan, another student of our Astronomy Academy, and he's a student of um, uh, English school in, the, in Nicosia, he will make a talk about this meteoroid. Ara, are you ready? Yes. So I will talk about the BX1 2024 asteroid or meteoroid. Uh, here is the, the last picture that was taken before it collided with the Earth, or the last picture before the fireball. Uh, it was discovered by Hungarian researcher and asteroid hunter Christian Zarneski at 10.48 Central European time, 10 days ago approximately on the 20th of January, 2024. You can see a picture of him here. And it was an important discovery because um, it was the eighth asteroid that was predicted to collide with the Earth, and it collided with the Earth. And actually, out of these eight asteroids, three of them were discovered by this, um, this researcher, Christian Zarnevsky, which is impressive. And you can see here the telescope that he used to find it, the 60 centimeter Schmidt Cassegrain telescope in Hungary. Um, some statistics. It was approximately 100 kilogram, so it was very small. It didn't do any damage, nobody was hurt. And it had a mean diameter of approximately one meter. And here we can see a post uh, with some nice units used, the size of two ducks. And it hits above, Ger above Germany, around 60 kilometers west of Berlin. Um, these are the images that the researcher used to discover the asteroid. Can you see the differences between these three? Yes. Yeah, that, that's the asteroid. And it's moving behind or in front of the background stars. Um, you can see here the fireball of the asteroid. Um, and it's very bright. It's reached a magnitude of minus 22, which is around 5,000 times brighter than the full moon. So it almost looks like daytime, this picture. Uh, you can see this graph of instrumental, which is uncalibrated magnitude with time. And this is a peak. And all of this was around for five seconds. And, and it entered the Earth's atmosphere around three hours after its discovery at, at night time, 1.32 a.m. Central European time, which is the time that they use in Germany. And it traveled at 15.2 kilometers per second, which is relatively slow for an asteroid. Um, but it was almost vertical, 
and we will we will see the implication of this um, data. Uh, the impact site is about 60 kilometers west of Berlin. Um, so it was a populated area and many people could see it. So meteorites. Many people are starting to find meteorites of the meteoroid. And from the trajectory of the asteroid that it was falling, um, people can draw a map of where the expected place the meteorites will be found can is. And the largest one of them is predicted to have a mass of 0 0.3 kilograms somewhere over here. And it is unusual in the way that they don't have a black crust that you often find on meteorites. And that is likely because of the material that they are made of, which is likely obrite. And because the angle that the asteroid fell is very, um, very large, it was almost vertical, the area that they can be found in is very small. And as a result, asteroid hunter or meteorite hunters have a large chance of finding them. And you can see the dedication. They are searching for meteorites in these very cold conditions and even going on private property. So much that the owner of this field had to post this on the internet, telling them to not go on this on his field. And thanks for listening. Uh, this is a duck. And this is the explanation on that website. Fifty one centimeters. So around two ducks is one meter. And actually it's obvious at the beginning they recommend one uh, hundred kilograms and the maximum mass of a fallen body is just three hundred grams. So it means that yes. it, sh it should uh, partly uh, burn out and just some material will be decaying many, many pieces. Yes. And there so, are many meteorites found. Some more questions? Yeah, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin Johnson. Um, I was just wondering, it's... um. It's quite surprising, really. We didn't get a lot of notice as to when it was arriving, just three hours after it was discovered. Um, is that normal? Or I assume we um, knew where most of these rocks were. In this case, yes, it was normal because that thread was very small. Just, okay. Just one meter. Yeah. So it was very impressive that uh, Christian Zarnevsky was able to find the asteroid from these three pictures. If it yeah. was further away from the Earth, then we wouldn't be able to detect it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Actually, the very first which was discovered like this pass already the Earth. Not fell on the earth, but the very first which was discovered already, they found out that it was past the earth already safely and <laughs> fly away. But the first which fell on the earth, if I remember correctly, it was in uh, beginning of this millennia, and it fell in, fell down in uh, uh, Sudan, and it was more, a longer time for uh, before moment of discovery and moment of fall. And that's why many uh, people prepared. They came to the site where it should be, uh, the fall should happen. They observe it and even collect material. Well, so, so, but it was so many years ago. And you see, during all this time, as Ara said, only eight predictions happened. Yeah, yeah. So, so not very often happened. Is it is it possible to um, once they've been discovered, even at short notice, is it possible to track it on radar for the last part of the re-entry, the entry? Um, before it collides. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, like in this case, if I remember correctly from my research. 
uh, in the last few minutes, they couldn't see that, right? Because it was behind the Earth's shadow. So they could see it like between three hours and the last 10 minutes. And then the last 10 minutes, they couldn't see it. And it was only visible as the fireball here. Yeah. Okay. No. I have a, a question about uh, this. The person who discovered it has been successful. How, how many did you say he discovered? Uh, three. Three. So with with this equipment, he's discovered three. Mm, so yeah. if more people are observing, we would probably discover more, I guess. Yes. Or is he just discovering the ones that are, like it's interesting to me. And to me because it, how many people are observing like he is. Yes, because of uh, I know that many uh, methods of astronomy they have in their possession 50 centimeter telescopes aperture. So 60 centimeter. Yes, yeah, there is difference, but not dramatic. And what's interesting for me is Concola Observatory. This observatory is known to me for uh, solar observations. So they do not only the sun. Yeah, it's just interesting that like, this is so so successful. Yes, here I, I should have, yes, Christian Starnesky is 49 years old, uh, researcher, asteroid hunter, um, Hungarian teacher of geography and prolific discoverer of minor planets and supernova. Thank you, Ara. Thank you very much. Thank you. World tree in modern culture. Uh, so I want to first introduce to the theme, and it's about archaeoastronomy, and then we'll do uh, some things about modern culture, how it, how we have it these days. So we will discuss uh, to, uh, the connection between total solar eclipses and creation of the world. Then this brings us to new concept of origin of world tree. And then we will see world tree not generally in modern culture, but just in science fiction. So how it is, uh, we could observe it in uh, uh, works of a uh, different uh, type of culture in science fiction section. Well, let's start with uh, the first one. So total solar eclipse and creation of the world. Uh, this part of... Uh, Discussion was already made uh, by Keaton Planetarium and Observatory and people uh, who made it before in the big change of millennia. Uh, and uh, the concept is that observations of total solar eclipse, uh, which was made by late Neolithic, uh, sorry, late Paleolithic period people, uh, we name them hunting gathering people that period they develop model of dying and rebirth of the god of the sun so here is the uh, possible observation those days in fact this one is photo of total solar eclipse in the united states tw in 2017 this photo was made by Oleg curricula from ukraine we were together at our expedition in the united states and uh, this row of photos are made by him. So at the beginning of total solar eclipse, we have the sun. The sun then hides from the point of view of uh, pre prehistoric human. Uh, it, it, the interpretation was that the sun is, is uh, hidden behind uh, an, island, an island somewhere in the sky. And uh, island means that it is in waters. And the sun is hidden and sets and sets behind a steep hill. So this is our steep hill. And then the sun dies and then rebirth. And then we have, after rebirth, the sun rising again from this steep hill. So that was the ancient 
uh, not ancient, prehistoric uh, interpretation of total solar eclipse. The point is that total solar eclipse is not uh, going every day. As a result, people who observe it, they have to explain to the next generation that, yes, they saw it, that it wasn't just with the sun. There were many other phenomena connected with it, like uh, total darkness around, appearance of stars in sky, and so on. Different behavior of, of uh, uh, animals around. So uh, they started to consider it uh, like uh, during the eclipse, they observe the struggle of order with house and uh, the sun represents the order and this disappearance of the sun looks like uh, chaotic forces uh, came uh, going to win and then the sun restore everything back. So that was the concept and this uh, part of, of from totality to birth of the sun rising over the steep hill was the uh, concept of creation of the world and it was uh, it is known all over the world uh, in uh, myths and the other areas of human culture so uh, how will uh, knowledge about total solar eclipse this observation be transferred to the next generations. In our days, we have experiment and observations, but till now, if in a university they have a, a, in curriculum a, a supernova discussion, they did not take a star and make produce with it supernova. Or if they have in curriculum solar eclipse, they did not do it for students. So we don't have such technology and such abilities till now. So it means that an experiment is not uh, available for such type of uh, phenomena yet. So that's what's left. You observe it from time to time, and then uh, total solar eclipse happened far area in the same area statistically once in 300 years. So humans don't live so long. So it means that next generation got it not from experiment, not from observations, but that's what's left is just to believe. They have to believe that their uh, uh, fathers, mothers, they observe it, or grandfathers, grandmother observe it, or grand grand, and so on. So they don't have their own experience, but they just believe. Uh, they believe that the world was created during total solar eclipse, and this is a cornerstone point. So because of this, uh, and because of total solar eclipse is a rare phenomena, it seems that uh, the way to transfer knowledge through belief became the, practically the only way how, uh, how to explain that it was. So this belief brought to a new type of activity in human uh, culture. It is mythology. Humans developed their concept of uh, how the world was created and other myths and uh, rituals. Uh, these days, it is uh, there were some people who uh, researched rituals in the previous century, but mostly main data were collected, uh, as I could understand, at the end of previous century and practically this century. So I mean, uh, main uh, not main data. Data were collected during a uh, long time, but they were summarized, and people start to pay attention to uh, rituals themselves only these days. So what we have, rituals, and uh, one of, uh, part of it is holidays. It's a kind of ritual, but for a long time. And the uh, aim, aim of uh, the rituals and, uh, uh, hol uh, and holidays were to restore the order. So all this data were collected for a long time and we found out that practically constantly each ritual means that uh, we have disorder and we want to restore the initial order. In, in fact, practically each ritual is the repeating of creation of the world for this specific situation, for example. And uh, it is, it is uh, noted uh, sidely, uh, on a side that holidays may took half of the whole year time in society. And uh, that's achievement of 
culturologist, ethnographers and others people who found out this data about human behavior. And uh, for example, we have many different ceremonies. This is one of them in modern life, marriage registration. What we have, we have celebrant, so this person or this person does matter in which country. We have reason for ceremony. So this couple and this couple. And we have participants who has to prove that yes, during this ritual, the event is achieved. And so on. So even now, does matter which religion or without any religion, we still have ceremonies. We still have holidays, which many cases repeat this prehistoric times concept and each of them is uh, tend to have to repeat the uh, creation order out of disorder well so it's about creation of the world how it is connected with total solar eclipses uh, origin of the world tree it, it's a bit interesting thing it was uh, tricky and wasn't so obvious from the beginning but finally it was found out what's going on the first connection of world tree with eclipses was uh, conducted here in Kitten Planetarium and Observatory almost 10 years ago. And it was uh, only specific part, world tree and uh, Slavs culture. In Slavs culture, there is island, they name it Buyan, and on that island, there is world tree. So it's a standard uh, and widely known uh, concept. Which is which survived in mostly fairy tales in uh, the, uh, in the culture. So this connection was established, but later uh, research was conducted and it was found out that uh, it uh, there is one much more interesting connection. So uh, world tree did not appear just from nothing. So what we have in the uh, ritual integration from chaotic parts to original order was established and during ritual repeating of the act of creation was conducted this is as uh, i already said is achievement without any astronomical point of view which was already made by ethnographers and linguists and other people so many many people participated to find out that that what we have in ritual and uh, that what uh, comes from uh, Kitten Planetarium and Observatory is that the act of creation is in fact description of the total solar eclipse. So this fact is uh, has basement, astronomical basement, uh, total solar eclipse. And uh, this slide is from another talk, which was already done two years ago. Here is the link you may uh, watched by yourself the link is precise to this very slide so you may take it at 300 3081st second so uh, in late paleolithic age when there was hunting and gathering uh, observation of totality brought to myth of creation and end of the world as a result this uh, steep hill was named uh, prim primeval mound and uh, in the Fertile Crescent, it's area mm, where is Mesopotamia, let's say now, uh, the uh, transformation happened. Uh, the steep hill, this word, which is in Nostratic language used in Fertile Crescent uh, by peoples, Kara, was transformed uh, in proto in the European language uh, in Perku, which means oak. So this transformation happened. And as a result, it is uh, Proto-Indo-European uh, peoples, they created on the place of uh, primeval mount, they created Oak. And this Oak became world tree all over the world. So achievement of uh, linguists is this one. They found out this connection. This connection was not the only one. They consider origin of Oak in Proto-Indo-European language other models as well. But this model easily uh, connects us with the concept of total solar eclipse. Indeed, if uh, the steep hill Kara is became Oak, 
then Steep Hill it takes special place in the outlook of people. It is in a, a myth of creation of the world. It is from uh, that place from where the sun rises. And uh, that's why this transformation becomes uh, very productive. So we found out that uh, world tree is not very, very old. It's just old. It's appeared when Proto-Indo-European language appeared that period. And we have many different ceremonies connected with uh, uh, world tree in many ways. For example, here you, we have an old concept of world tree, which is in center of, uh, in ceremony of uh, new year, we consider like establishing new order, end of previous period and the beginning of the new one. So as a result, will appearance of world tree here is uh, obvious for people who develop these rights. And uh, at this particular picture, you may see that these are old enough, this is very old, this you may recognize from for centuries, but uh, teddy bear is not old. Teddy bear exists just 100 years, so it's <laughs> new part of the ceremony. And uh, to put gifts under this tree, uh, so all these uh, rites and ceremonies, all this connected with the uh, world tree up to in modern life. Worry. Oh. In, we are accustomed to it, but we never think that it is it has so deep connection. Well, what's, what's about world tree in science fiction? This is the most interesting part because of if we look, let's stop now. Uh, once upon a time, the solar system was created. It is just luck that the moon is at special uh, distance from the Earth exactly. The, to create to cover the sun, the moon could be closer, the moon could be farther, or and so on. But it's just luck; it's precisely cover the sun. There is no other celestial body in the solar system where we may observe uh, total solar eclipses. There is nothing like this at all in our, in our solar system. So it's just luck. That's why, as we see, appearance of world tree in other cultures, not the cultures of humanity, looks a bit strange. But here we are. For example, let's look at Avatar. And uh, there is tree of voices. There, there are three types of trees there in the, uh, in, in the movie. And uh, here we could see celebrant. Here we could see a reason for ceremony. These people uh, were injured and they should be rehealing. And we have a lot, a lot, a lot of participants. So practically same structure, practical same right, but somewhere far away from theirs. Okay, another one. This one is one of the most impressive and so it became the reason why this talk is going. Because of uh, I am Groot, it was uh, made, oh, I wrote 2023. I'm sorry, could be a mistake, could be 2022. But anyway, it's it's modern. It just created. Uh, I'm groom. So it's a very long movie. It's episode second, uh, episode, uh, episode five in season two. Each movie is about three, four minutes. So you may spend, <laughs> dedicate some time to watch them. And uh, Groot is just an intelligent tree. It appeared in many different movies of Marvel Studio. And what's going on in this specific episode? Uh, it, uh, the narrator said that uh, there should be seven of the universe somewhere on a planet. So our um, Groot arrived to that special planet. Uh, he achieved special uh, temple of sacred tree, Dreslar. Here is seed of this Dreslar, and from this seed, the new universe with happiness and all the re all this type of things will appear. Okay, so as a result, you may, I don't want to sp spoil your watching the movie. <laughs> Do it by yourself. Temple was de destroyed finally, and as a result, we see after the uh, from ruins of the temple, we see the appearance of new tree. This tree is Groot himself. But it is a way how we have creation of the new world. So what we have, total solar eclipse is play of luck of, of solar 
a system. So we just we are just lucky that we have it. Uh, it is this uh, event which developed tree of life concept in human uh, per perception of the of the world. And uh, I believe that it is completely inconsistent to uh, put tree of life into civilizations all over the universe in different galaxies, in different star systems or whatever, because of it's uh, not so lucky to have tree of life, so similar development to tree of life in other civilizations. So that's all. Our next science cafe will be on the 27th of February, as usual at the end of month, the last uh, Tuesday. It's always at 20 o'clock Cyprus time, time and two hours difference of the universal time. We will announce the topic later. And if you want to present your own, you are heartily welcome. Just discuss. Thank you for attention, your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.